there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. This will be a program that you will want to save and pass along to friends and family members. Henry Groover, one of the most respected watchmen in the body of Christ, will be my guest for the entire program. Bible prophecy teacher John Shuri will be my guest tomorrow. John believes that the late Pastor David Wilkerson's prophecy about America will happen very soon. It would be prudent to prayerfully consider Henry Groover's message today with John Shorey's message tomorrow. And then my guest on Friday will be Australian Christian business executive Peter J. Daniels, who, at the age of 81 has a burning passion to inspire and raise up a generation of new young Christian business leaders to finance the last great wave of evangelization before Jesus Christ returns. Now, there's a common thread running through all three programs. Henry Groover will retell several of the visions that the Holy Spirit gave him about a surprise attack on the United States. John Shuri will talk about David Wilkerson's vision of the burning and looting of the United States. And Peter Daniels will talk about finding new sources of revenue to finance the last wave of soul winning in the world. If the vision seen by Henry Groover and David Wilkerson are soon to be fulfilled, there must be another source of wealth on the earth to replace the money that has flowed out of America to missionary church-building, and soul-winning projects around the world. That's because the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Then shall the end come. God's will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. His eyes are searching the earth to and fro for men and women who will believe and trust him. We're living in perilous times, but these are exciting times, too. The Old Testament prophets saw this age thousands of years ago. The New Testament apostles prophesied about the last days and the glorious appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. All of them would have loved to be alive on earth to see it. We are a privileged generation. So don't allow the instability of the world, the rising danger, and the growing hatred of God frighten you. We were told that these things would happen. Instead, rejoice that our Father divinely destined your birth so that you would be alive in this present age. We are so close to the end of the age that I say to you, surrender to Christ and give yourself totally to Him, that the Holy Spirit may use you to your maximum potential for the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, my special guest today is known to many of you, Henry Groover, known as the Prayer Walker. He's walked across and prayed over many cities on many continents for decades. His ministry is Joyful Sound Ministries. Henry, my dear friend, how are you today? Well, I'm doing great, Rick. How are you? It sounds like you have been a busy man and always are. Henry, where are you today as we record this program? Well, I'm out on the side of a mountain outside of Kalispell, Montana. Ooh, Kalispell, Montana. <laughs> How's the scenery? It's beautiful. It's been raining up a storm, but the last three days have been beautiful. And uh, Well, I'm glad, Henry, that you could take time to, uh, to be with us today. We believe that uh, the Holy Spirit will be uh, speaking through the three of us in this broadcast. Henry, how many years have you been on the road preaching and prophesying about the coming of the Lord 
Well, I started in January 1961 walking and uh, was for a few years there. Uh, when I got married and had some children, uh, I did work in electronics, worked at Nuclear Corporation and Motorola. And then uh, 34 years ago, I left full-time employment to travel the world and walk the world. And uh, so now I'm working on uh, my 50th nation will be at the end of August, which will be Taiwan. And then my 51st nation will be Singapore in the first two weeks of September this year. And uh, so it's been an interesting thing. I look at Taiwan as being my jubilee year for nations, 50 years. Praise and, God. Uh, Henry, it, um, you, uh, you gained a notoriety in the 1990s uh, when people began hearing and talking about a vision that that you experienced uh, concerning a, a future war uh, involving the United States and, and Russia. We, we have a lot of new listeners. We have a lot of young people that have never heard of you or or this vision. And mm-hmm. uh, we were, we welcome all of these uh, wonderful new people to the program. It's just we're just amazed at how fast this is. This program is growing in in recent months, particularly throughout 2014, but what, please take take a few minutes and and uh, tell them about that vision and how that that really propelled you um, on this journey that has taken you to so many nations. What, what did you see, and when did it happen? Could I could I give you first a 1979 vision? Absolutely. Uh, the reason I feel this is very timely is I just heard about your program with the general and the plane flying over, knocking out all the communications of our high-tech uh, destroyer or battleship, military ship. Uh, when I heard that, it immediately took me back to 1979. Uh, in this vision, I was standing on the bridge of a ship from Taiwan. I was talking to an admiral, who former admiral of the Taiwan Navy, in the vision, and he had uh, left and re- retired from the Navy and loved shipping so much. And so we were just talking how he went to become a captain of a merchant ship in the vision, when all of a sudden... Uh, all of these boats begin to come in, in the vision, uh, uh, along the mouth of the Columbia River. And here come these boats into Astoria, the city of Astoria, throwing hooks up on the docks and climbing up and just shooting every person they saw in sight in Astoria. Are you talking about Columbia River in the northwestern United States? Yes, the Mm -hmm. Columbia River and the mouth of the Columbia. You have Ilwaco, Washington, on one side, the state of Washington. On the other side, you have Astoria, Oregon. And these, these invading ships, personnel ships, were just coming in on Astoria, Oregon. And it was like they were coming around this Taiwan ship I was on, and they didn't even see it. And the captain and I and the head officer, main off, first officer, we were all standing on the bridge where the wheel would be, and we were watching this invasion. And the Taiwan former admiral says, your nation is under attack. And we're standing watching this, and they're not coming up the gangplank onto the ship we're on. It's like they don't even see it. However, at that instant, now here's the significance of this whole incident that you people out there have been hearing from the general about the capability of Russia to fly over our warships and completely demobilize them electronically, shut them down. Coming out from under the docks, these big docks of Astoria, are flying planes, but they're World War II vintage. There's no new planes. There's new modern planes. They're all war, World War II, and they began going out attacking the mothership. That was the end of the vision, and I put that vision on the shelf. It didn't make a lick of sense to me. 
But I tell you, people, it makes very good sense now. I always wondered, why would we resort to World War II airplanes when we have such high technology and all? Because World War II airplanes had the old vacuum tubes for communications and had their own stick shift that they could guide that plane where they wanted, not a computerized automatic pilot type communication system and defense system. And I, I really have been thinking about that these last few days since I heard about this situation. And I thought, dear Lord, now Russia, Russia has high-tech things too, but their planes are the old vacuum tube, vacuum tube type planes, not the solid state type for communications. Now think about this. Here we are. In modern technology, but Russia still is holding on to the old vacuum tube, which cannot be knocked out with EMF or electromagnetic force or the force of, of explosions of nuclear magnitude. And I think about this often and think, dear Lord, we thought Russia was so far behind in technology when we viewed some of their aircraft we had shot down and... Uh, all because they have the old communication systems in them and all that. But Russia knows, and they have done far more nuclear testing than America has, so they are far more advanced in the area of what it takes to knock down computers, electronics, or cell phones, you name it, that are solid state. And so just a little note in that, uh, in the beginning, to, to kind of introduce you to that. Hen Hen Henry, can I ask you one question? Absolutely. Do, do you think that the reason you saw the American military response that it was old World War II planes was because that was the only thing that could fly? Yes. Mm -hmm. In other words... That was my thinking. I thought, how can that be? In, in other words, whatever happened totally wiped out the high-tech military aircraft and the US military had to bring out the old World War II stuff and try to fight off the attack in a last attempt of defense because everything else was shut down well you know in 79 nobody was thinking about cyber attacks no or EMPs no. and uh, even even in, uh, on December the 14th, 1986, when the Lord showed me the Russian invasion vision, uh, in that vision you asked me to relate. Now this can begin to tie together some understanding of where we are. Uh, in that vision, <clears throat> the Lord I, had me high up in the heavens, and I saw Russian submarines along our coastal area. They were so close that their noses, they were on the bottom of the, the sea, and they were so close that the light color of the sand of our beaches were still, still lightly colored into the ocean. The first one I saw was right off the coast from New York City, and all my alarms went off. And as all my alarms went off, then, all of a sudden, I saw radio, what I thought was radio towers, springing up all across America like an instant growing forest, just all across America. And I thought there were radio stations. And then I see these submarines on the northwest coast, up by Seattle Bellevue, down around the uh, California coast. There were three of these submarines. And then one off from the coast of Florida. And... Uh, as I see these radio towers shooting up, all of a sudden I see them I see them dotting out like transmitting or receiving, and then all of their transmissions that you would if you were to draw a sketch of a of a transmission of a of a broadcast, it would be dot 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 going out through the atmosphere so you know it's broadcasting. They all sprinkled to the ground as dust. And the ex instant I saw them sprinkling to the ground as dust I cried out in the heavens, O oh Lord, the people will not even know what hit them. 
And then I saw this missile come out from under this submarine, out of this submarine that was off from the coast of New York City. That missile came out of that, that, that submarine so fast and went up over New York City that we wouldn't even have any time except to perhaps on our system say there is a projectile coming over New York City and then it exploded. You have, you have less than a minute and that thing exploded. And when it exploded, I watched New York City disappear in dust. You thought the Twin Towers was bad. That was a little dust storm compared to the dust storm of the Sahara Desert. It, it was so such magnitude. And the buildings disappeared. Well, at that time, in 1986, my family lived clear over in Portland, Oregon. So I looked all the way across the continent, and up above Portland, I Seattle, saw Seattle, Bellevue, and I saw an explosion there. And then I saw another explosion down by San Francisco between uh, toward Los Angeles and that area and San Diego. Three explosions on California. And then I saw another one off between Miami and Tampa, Florida. And so we had one, two, three, four, five, six nuclear blasts that just literally leveled everything. And uh, I stood there on the Eagle Tower of Carnarvon, Northern Wales, literally, when I had the vision. The Narvan uh, Castle of Northern Wales is where Charles was coronated as the Prince of Wales. And his throne is there that he was coronated in as the Prince of Wales and the black slate uh, slab that the throne was on, the black slate throne. And all the information pictures there about his coronation as the Prince of Wales. And I'm looking down on that, and I'm looking down on the village of Carnarvon, northern Wales, and I'm looking at a Saturday morning, uh, business as usual, no sirens, no alarms going off. And so I turn and look off toward the, the uh, sea that comes in, the inlet that comes in all, all the way up into Liverpool, England, along Wales and Scotland and all that, that inland sea that comes in there. And there were battleships off from Carnarvon Castle, British battleships, and I'm watching them. This is literally, this is not a vision. After the vision, I'm watching them, and there's no alarms going off. Uh, there's no one hurrying back to the ship. It's all business as usual. And I realized this could not be happening now, or definitely Great Britain would know, I would think, unless the communications were so well shut down that they don't know. But in the realization of that, I cried out and I said, standing there on that eagle tower of Carnarvon Castle, Oh, Father in heaven, if this is not happening now, then what will be the sign of its happening and of its time. And the Lord spoke so clearly to me and said, now this was December 14th, 1986. This is before Glasnost, Perestroika. This is before you heard anything on news about the Cold War being over, uh, about the superpower of Russia, all of a sudden communism failing, and America, as we saw Senior Bush sitting with beside Gorbachev, and the American flag was crossed with a new red, white, and blue, Russian flag, and standing directly behind Gorbachev was their top commander, General Alexander Lebed. And uh, that was before all of this. This all happened about two years later. But uh, the Lord said to me, when here was his answer, when I said, what will be the sign of this and of its time? And the Lord said to me, when Russia opens her gates and lets the masses go, the free world will occupy themselves with transporting, housing, and caring for the masses that are being let go from the communist world, will begin letting their weapons down, crying peace and safety. And that was the end of that Russian invasion vision. Now, could I give one more vision real quick to help you understand something else? Yes, but I, I want you to repeat that 
statement the Lord gave That's you. What would be what would be the sign when of this is going to happen? And of its time. And he said, when Russia, the Lord said to me, when Russia opens her gates. Now, remember, he said to me, Russia, it was still called the Soviet Union or Socialist Republic. It was not called Russia. They only started calling it Russia, just Russia, after they said communism was dead and the Cold War is over. And they began letting all their other countries go and releasing them from under their hold. So he said, when Russia opens her gates and lets the masses go, the free world will occupy themselves with transporting, housing, and caring for the masses, will begin letting down their weapons, crying peace and safety. And that's when it will happen. So where are we now in that scenario? Think about it. All right, That's now, very interesting. You started to tell us one more thing. Now, the vision that I call the Prince Charles vision, the Prince Charles vision came after that. And in that vision, uh, an angel came to me. I still lived in Portland, Oregon. We didn't move to the Midwest until February of 1990. So we lived in Portland, Oregon at that time. And uh, an angel, I was in prayer down in my my living room beside the wood stove, (laughs) down on my face praying, and all of a sudden I heard a voice, and it said, get up on your knees and I'll speak to you. And I got up on my knees, and uh, he said to me, this angel said to me, now I want you to load your children in your van and go up Highway 26, east on Highway 26, towards Mount Hood. When you get up on the mountain, you'll come to government camp. It's literally, to this day, it's still called government camp, where you turn to go up toward Timberline Lodge and the snow ski lodge up there on Mount Hood. When you get on Highway 26, where it wraps around the river, heading toward Hood River and the Columbia River all around that mountain, when you get to government camp, look at your malometer, and go five miles to the tent, and there will be a pull-off on the right. Take your wife and your children, and there will be a switchbacking footpath going down into a canyon there. Lead them and let them follow and let your wife bring up the rear. And you will come out into a level space and a clearing And then you'll cross over that, but there you will meet a person who will direct you what to do next. And so, sure enough, in the vision, we we go five miles to the tent. There's a pull-off. We go down the switchbacking trail in the vision. And we come to the clearing, and an English butler meets us. He's in the full top hat and tuxedo with a long tail. And he has a white towel over his right arm. And he says in his very heavy British accent, very well, you've arrived, follow me. And so we head across the clearing and then down a grade. And as we're going down the grade, I can see there are five rows of chairs with 12 chairs in each one. Five rows of chairs with 12 chairs. There's a little platform on the, in the front of that on this level area in the bottom of the canyon. And on that platform, I can see one microphone up on a pedestal and one chair on the back of the platform. I can see two men standing down just as you're about to approach the forward uh, right side of the 60 chairs, and I recognize one of them uh, that I had met before. And then there's another one, and I didn't know him, and it turned out to be a general, and it turned out to be a senator whom I, the senator, I had known before. And so as we walk up, the butler introduces me and my family to the general. And the general I had not met, but the senator I had. And the general said, yes, he says, you're here today. That means it's time to begin. And so Please be seated. So we're seated. Our family is seated right on the front row. 
and I'm sitting right beside where the senator is standing at the right of me, of the front chairs. The general is standing up beside him yet, and about that time, a big egg beater, what we call egg beater, a double-bladed helicopter comes right over the canyon, carrying a blue, what I thought looked like a construction office, but I realized later it's the total blue of, uh, of our UN, our United Nations blue, and uh, our, uh, our military of the UN. And it's carrying this construction office, and it very carefully lets it down on the level place up above that we just crossed over. The butler is going up there. The helicopter releases the cable that's holding it and flies away. The butler goes up to the door of this little construction office, like a trailer, and opens the door, and out comes Prince Charles. And he is dressed in what you would say like the African full rim brown hat, khaki brown hat, this the short sleeve khaki top shirt, and cut off above the knees khaki pants, and kind of long socks and sort of hiking boots. And here he comes down with the butler toward us, and I'm looking at Prince Charles. His face is red and puffy. And I realize as he's getting closer, he has really been crying and up he comes and uh, with this the butler introduces him to me he, he greets the general and he greets the senator as though he knows them and the butler introduces him to me and then says this is his family and that is his wife and with that Charles says very well thank you for coming today you are here by my request. Please take note, I have a message for you. And be seated. So with that, we're seated, and I realize all the other next chairs behind us are all full of people. I never saw who they were. But I glanced back, and I thought, well, that's interesting. When did all of them arrive? And so the general and Charles go up on the little stage in front of us, and they're talking. I can't hear what they're saying. Well, then the general nods. He's, he's a four-star general. He nods, and he goes and sits down on the back of this little stage, and Charles turns around to the microphone, and he says these words, Thank you for coming today. You're here by my request. I want to inform you that your nation is at war, and you have a battle to fight. But the saddest thing is, you must fight it without God. And with that, the general jumped to his feet on the back of the platform, stepped over and went off the platform, came around the edge of it, came up right looking up at Charles on the platform with his hands like in a position like on his hips, like as a matter of fact. He says to Charles, we know our nation is at fight, uh, is at war, and we have a battle to fight, but we didn't know God had anything to do with it. And with that, Charles comes up with his hand, pointing his finger down in a sweeping motion, right in the face of the general, and says these words, And, sir, that is your mistake. And with that, Charles and the general are arguing over whether God had anything to do with it or not. And as everyone is watching this argument going on, all of a sudden I see a motion about, oh, probably 100 feet to the left of Charles and the general and the little stage. It's a massive desert green frog. Now think about where all our trouble is and has been since Russia opened their gates and lets the masses go. Where is it at? The Middle East, the desert battles. Kuwait, Iraq, now Afghanistan. And so, and you will find very clearly Jeremiah 51, 50 and 51 is a tremendous description of desert storm and all this and the battle that's been taking place. But anyhow... As they're, they're arguing over whether God had anything to do with it or not, 
I'm watching this massive frog because what caught my attention was the frog had lifted its head, and as it lifted its head, the, the, the sac for air under its chin begin to fill up like it's going to make a croaking sound like they do when they make their croaking sound. Now, that frog was probably as big as a one-bedroom house. It was an enormous frog. I couldn't understand why Charles and the general couldn't see it, and I looked around at the people, and they're all focused on Charles and the general. They're not paying any attention to the frog. And terror came over me like terror when I saw the, 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 the communication sprinkled down from those radio towers, which I thought were radio towers in that Russian invasion vision. But now crossing America, I've just come from Maine all the way across the Midwest to the Southwest to all the way up into Montana. They are cell phone towers. They're not station towers, but they're cell phone towers. But they could also be radio towers in the sense of the very thing that you're doing right now, listening to radio all over this nation, and I know that probably is by satellite and computer, but uh, think about it, the communication shutting down. And so as I'm watching this frog, back to what I call the Prince Charles vision, as I'm watching this massive frog, and I'm thinking, if that thing opens its mouth with that croaking sound, we're all dead. And as I thought that, all of a sudden I watched that big frog open its mouth, and out of its mouth, instead of a croaking sound, came a white vapor, and it came and enveloped Charles and the general, and it was heading our way. And I cried out, oh, Lord, help us, because I knew that white vapor would kill us all. And that instant I was caught up into the heavens looking down, on a place like Trafalgar Square, when I walked Trafalgar Square later, I recognized it. I thought, I've been here before. That's in the Prince Charles vision. Trafalgar Square has offices of all kinds of business and government and corporate uh, uh, hospitals and everything, and statues with Nelson's column and, and big lions, the British lions, on all four corners of it and a massive fountain in the middle of it. It's a representation of Great Britain and the British Empire. And I'm seeing what looked like Trafalgar Square, and all of these people come running out of all these buildings in their own occupational garb, nurses, nurses' uniform, welders, welder, hat and, and helmet on, uh, businessmen, and you name it, military people, all come running out into this square, and then I see them pointing up, to what would be to my left of hand up in the heavens where I am, they're pointing up to my left hand and they're laughing and mocking and saying, you can't hurt us, we're not afraid of you. And I look over to my left at what they're pointing at, and they're pointing at a military that goes into the heavens of weapons like I had never seen before. I described some of these weapons from, with military people and they have said they're lasers, and they are rocket launchers and uh, all different kinds. But the people, the warriors, the military people, had googie eyes like big goggles. And when I described those, they said, you're talking Russian poisonous gas uniform. You've described it perfectly. Googie eyes, snooted nose, which has the filtration unit in it over their mouth. It looks kind of almost like a horse, and the book of Revelation talks about this in a sense. And then their chest came out like the ribs of a locust, the locusts that make the humming sound in the trees in the summer. They had kind of ribbed look out on their chests, and the military told me that is the multiple filtration devices that they wear in their chemical warfare uniform and that I had perfectly described that. And the people in the square are pointing at this massive army of footmen that mount into the heavens with all kinds of military machinery, and I see a general up at the top. To me, he looked a lot like Alexander Lebed. But now there are many generals, I've learned since then, that look a lot like Alexander Lebed did, and Alexander Lebed is dead now. But... Uh, Anyhow, as the people are mocking this massive military that mounts into the heavens, this general's fist comes up, 
the, I can see the fury coming into his face of their mocking, saying, you can't hurt us, we're not afraid of you. You have no power anymore. And this fury comes into his face, and his fists come up in a sweeping motion like he's getting ready to box with somebody, and he screams out the words, present arms, aim, fire. And with that, these people with these, these gas-type uniforms on are firing at the people down into the square, I see arc-like lightning streaks go into the heavens, and I see missiles firing across the heavens, all in one quick sweep of emotion. I hear the bullets hitting the people in the square. Total terror hits them. You can tell they sincerely believe that this great army had no power, but when it began to fire on them, they knew they were in trouble, and that was the end of the vision. So you see, there are three visions that tell us something that will help you to understand where we are in this scenario right now. And uh, so we're in a very serious time right now, I believe with all my heart, a very serious time. And uh, as, as a body of believers, of Christians, we had better pray like we have never prayed before. We had better pray that... It, that God will teach us how to be in the Psalms 91 secret place of the Most High, abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. We had better be praying that we will hear the voice of God laughing, like Psalms chapter 2 clearly says, that the kings of the earth, they have set themselves in array against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands and break their, cast their cords asunder. Now think about that scripture. Who are the kings of the earth against? They are against the Lord, and they are against his anointed. What are the big battles that are going on in America today? You can't even, as a a military chaplain, you're not even supposed to use the name Jesus anymore. Uh, In our schools and everywhere, we're kicking the Lord out. And so we're in a very serious time, like Charles said, you're at, in, you're, you're at war and you have a battle to fight, and the saddest thing is you must fight it without God. And so we're in a very serious time right now where I see all of these things beginning to come together. Henry, there's a Mack truck coming down the center of the road and the American church doesn't see it. Um, no, they don't. We've got about they it. won't wake up. Henry... Uh, the last week of May, first week of June, I had I had such a heaviness in my spirit. I could not shake it. Mm-hmm. It was a foreboding that something very ominous is about to happen. I don't know whether it's the United States or another place in the world. I know on Monday, June 2nd, I came to work and I told our staff members i i don't know what this is i can't i can't get this heaviness off of me and i went into my office and i sat there for almost an hour on monday morning praying and reading the word and just asking the lord what is this why 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 are you putting this heaviness on me today but just before that i think it was late may you called me one evening and mm-hmm. you you were driving Mm-hmm. And it was around it was around eight eight thirty Eastern time. You were alone. You were driving somewhere, and, and mm-hmm. I got to tell you, Henry, you had uh, you had a you had a heaviness in your voice. You had a it was kind of a mm-hmm. mel- melancholy spirit. What what, mm-hmm. what are you what are you sensing? We've got like um, seven minutes remaining. What are you sensing right now in June two thousand fourteen? I. I, I was sensing, I was in the full-blown realization of the year 2014. 14 in Matthew chapter 1, there are three sets of 14s. And 14, 314s, bringing forth Jesus, bringing forth Christ. We're in 2014. 314s are 42. And... Uh, I was thinking about what is the Lord bringing forth in this 14, these three sets of 14s, did a study on it, and come to the realization that in animal husbandry, it takes 14 generations of breeding to bring forth a purebred. 
And I was crying out and saying, oh, Lord, whatever it takes. You said you would shake so that whatever can be shaken may remain. Whatever cannot be shaken may remain. And, Lord, just refine me. Refine me with the refiner's fire. And I'm telling you, I battled and I battled and I battled. Uh, I, the Lord took me to the woodshed and began dealing with me, and I began to feel like my life, was not worth anything uh if i couldn't have the lord if i i just cried out lord all i want is you all i want is you awaken me awaken my full being awaken me to what you're saying at this time awaken my my total senses that i may be a recipient of the presence of your glory that i may be caught up into your presence and be acceptable in your sight, Lord, I hunger, I can't, I have a hunger that cannot seem to be satisfied. Awaken me that I may receive of you what you have, because I feel like we've entered a whole new season. And if we don't get this, Lord, I don't know what will happen. I feel that I will miss out. I will totally miss out on all that I've been working with you in and walking with you in all these years. I feel like we're heading across the finish line, and we've got to get across that finish line in honor. We've got to get across it undefiled. And that was what I was in the the thralls of. And uh, many things manifested against my family. Many things manifested against us. It was unbelievable. It was almost like a nightmare of events that were unleashed that you could only make it through by just trusting, as the Amplified Bible says, trusting, relying, and clinging to the Lord. And you you heard my voice in the heat of that. I know you also expressed uh, a sadness in the sense yes. that you've spent so many years on the road preaching and retelling these visions and warning Americans and you've been away from your family so so often and and ten months a year for thirty three years and I remember that night you said Rick I I just want to go home and be with my wife mm-hmm. but do you do you do you sense do you feel in your spirit Henry that that we're coming up very quickly on the fulfillment of these visions. It's very, it was very hard for me to leave my wife a few days ago. Uh, I keep This keeps coming back to me. I told the Russian invasion vision to you people today on the air. But the day before, snow was blowing in my face. My pant legs were frozen up to my knees where I'd fallen through the creek. It was 17 degrees out in northern Wales. And the wind was blowing, and the Lord asked me, the day before he gave me the Russian invasion vision, he asked me, are you willing to lay your wife and your children on the altar and never see them again this side of heaven? And with the events that I see taking place right now, it is so hard for me to accept all the invitations I've had that will take me away from my family until until Thanksgiving, virtually till Thanksgiving. And I didn't want to leave home. And as I said to you, I just want to go home and be with my wife. I'm concerned with the signs of the times. Lord, are we in the thralls of this thing that once it happens, I'm going to be questioning every minute of the day, Lord, would I be offended at you if I don't see my wife and my children this side of heaven again? And I believe we're living in a season where he's asking us to be willing to lay down every precious thing that we have and follow the Lord with everything within us, even to the point of laying our wife and our family on the altar. I love my family. I, I sacrificed a lot to be away from them, but I thoroughly enjoy it when I'm with them. I love being with my family. I love my grandchildren and my great grandsons. I got three of them, and uh... Henry, I'm struggling with the very same thing. The Holy Spirit is dealing with me on this very issue. Bless your heart, Rick. It's not easy, is it? No, it is, and I, I, I have cried profusely at times with with great, um, great emotional pain, and mm-hmm. 
And because, but I know the, the Lord is saying the hour is close. Uh, vast amounts of souls are going to be swept into eternity. In an instant. Yes, yes. What the general told me over strategic command, when I asked him, I said, if all of this lets, goose, lets loose, how long will it take? What will be till it's all over? He looked at me with the sternest look, and he said, Henry, in 15 minutes, it's all over. From when the missiles start to fly, in 15 minutes, it's all over. Fifteen minutes. Henry, I, w- I want to ask you this question, I, and I don't want you to divulge any uh, confidential information, but in recent weeks, I'm I'm having conversations with uh, people that I know, people in the ministry, uh, mm-hmm. well-respected people, and they're telling me true stories that um, individuals that they know are suddenly being told by the Lord to get out of get out of California immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, are you hearing anything like this? Pastors, pastors are calling, emailing, saying, "What are you doing to my congregation, Henry? I have got people that have been so solid; they have been my right hand people for years in my church." All of a sudden, they're quitting high-paying jobs, their lovely homes, putting them up for sale, selling out what they can't move quickly inland to the United States and getting out of California. What are you doing to my people? I've been accused of, of, of causing families to leave fellowships and leave churches where they've been committed and dedicated, many of them for years. What are you telling these people? And, and I said, well, how do you know this? How do you know it's, what are you blaming me for? And they say, because there always have been in the past always wanting me to have you come and speak. And I keep telling them, I don't want this prophecy stuff. And I said, well, I told one pastor, I said, well, brother, if you out of your own mouth, these are such solid people. These are not flighty people. These are people that are very dedicated, have been your right hand. If they are hearing from God, and they've been trying to get you to have me come and speak, can't you at least investigate what God has shown me and what they've been listening to and why the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to them at this time? Uh, Henry, are most of these people on the West Coast? Yes, California. Clear up, up upper San Francisco all the way down to San Diego. Yeah, I, okay, one particular man, uh, a a regular guest on this program uh, called me several weeks ago, and he said, Rick, he said, a, a friend of mine who he and his wife are rock-solid Christians, quiet, mm-hmm. solid, stable people. And the Lord told them to get out of California by the end of May, no later than June. And they they heard so clearly that they didn't they didn't want to wait until June and take a chance. So they left California at the end of May. And mm. this gentleman was calling me saying, are you, are you hearing anything like this? Are any, anybody else telling you that, that, that the Spirit of the Lord is, is suddenly telling people to pack up and get out of California? Mm. Oh, my. Well, if you listen to my Russian invasion presentation and I saw subs attack America... You will hear me tell how for over a decade I tracked the jet streams, watching the jet streams every day in April and May from up above Seattle, Bellevue, all the way along the Pacific Coast, all the way around California, and the jet streams went back out the Baja Peninsula for over a decade, April, May. And so I felt such it when people would ask me back years ago when I was doing this, what do you think, what month do you think would be the, the most likely that the attack would take place? I was even asked that on the Looking Glass fleet of Stratcom. And I told him, I says, without a doubt, April, May. And, and the, the officer, a strategist in charge said, why, why April, May? And I said, look at the jet streams. The kill factor would be the highest. And in Ezekiel 38, They are coming into the middle of the land to take cattle and gold and corn. Henry, the United States to me is Ezekiel thirty-eight all the way 
then is Israel. They will hit America first for the cattle, the corn, and the gold, and then we are down. They know we will not interfere, and then they will hit Israel like a cloud, the other part of Ezekiel 38. I, I'm going to throw something out to you that um, may may be a an alternative explanation for why the Lord was talking to you about the jet stream. Mm-hmm. Um, about three years ago, I was seeking the Lord earnestly in our chapel, and he said to me, I heard these words in my spirit very clearly. I wrote them down. Earth changes, radiation, do your research, make an intelligent decision. Ooh. And immediately, the jet stream appeared before my eyes. Oh. And so I, I, I went. I left the chapel, I went to my office, got online, started studying the jet stream, and I noticed how the jet stream swoops down over Japan and then goes back up the northern Pacific and then comes down the west coast of Canada and the United States and then across mm-hmm. the Midwest. So my, you know, I'm thinking Fukushima. Fukushima. Because and they've had a meltdown now, haven't they? Well, they, they've got three reactors in Meltdown. They've never stopped it. It can't be stopped. And, um, you know, one of the reactors is ready to collapse at, at any moment. I mean, it's teetering on uh, becoming the... Well, it, it. I mean, Fukushima is already the worst natural disaster in the history of the planet. But it, yes, it, it has the potential of even becoming worse. If something would happen to Fukushima where the entire thing collapses. There's a vast amount of radiation that would be released into the jet stream that would come down over California and go across the Midwest. It'll go across the Midwest and then across the East Coast and back out uh, into the Atlantic. So Mm -hmm. uh, that's that is another another possibility, a a viable one. I, I can I can truly see that. And Having been in Japan many, 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 many months since the Fukushima uh, TPP, Tokyo Public Power, is not allowing the people of Japan to know the seriousness of this. And uh, people within 10 miles of that reactor aren't even afraid anymore. They're saying, oh, it won't hurt us. It won't hurt us. And the world, you know, National Regulatory, Nuclear Regulatory, International Nuclear Regulatory Commission has said there should be a minimum of a 50-mile radius around it. And and they've got people living a 10-mile. The city of Fukushima itself, right there by Sendai, I've been in that city preaching, and you're, you're two miles from that reactor. Henry, I want you to take the closing minutes and to speak to the people all over the world who are listening to us by... Uh, AM, FM radio, by shortwave radio, by the Internet, blog talk radio, whatever method that they're listening to us on their smartphones, whatever, uh, speak to them about uh, the urgency of the hour that we're in right now. The scriptures that I have just woke up with again and again, I encourage you to go to Isaiah chapter 51 and chapter 52. And the first words of those two chapters, uh, I'm sorry, verse 9 of chapter 51, the first words that are spoken, verse 9 of chapter 51, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. For thou art he that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon. Art thou not it which hath dried the sea? And he goes down the whole list. And then chapter 52, verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, and the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down. O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the band of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Isn't it interesting that Israel, Jerusalem, is in the limelight of the news this last week? It's in the limelight of uh, of 
the Pope going over there and all of these things taking place. And I say to you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are having a struggle awakening your senses to the presence of God, awakening your cry and your desire for his presence and for a manifestation of his presence in such a magnitude that you are just literally saturated with him, cry out for it, you can have it. Ask him for it. Ask him for that awakening of his presence over your life. Cry out and get desperate. The cry of the destitute is always answered by the Lord. Don't think it will happen by you just saying, well, Lord, whatever will be, will be. I'm just trusting that if I die, I die. If I live, I live. If you come and take me away, then I miss it. Uh, Whatever will be, don't shake yourself from that and cry out to the Lord with all of your being and with all of your heart, awaken my senses, awaken my spiritual senses, awaken my spirit to hear from you, Lord. I want to hear from you momentarily. I want to hear from you daily. I want to stay in fellowship, communion with you second by second. And if you will do that, I assure you, you will not be deceived by what is the great deception of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Verse 10, you will not be deceived by him who comes in all deceivableness, all manner of lying signs and wonders. You will not be deceived because of his signs and wonders. But if you don't do that and don't awaken, you will be deceived because you have not received the love of the truth. Love the truth. Get a hold of your Bible. Read it. Ask God to make it burn in your heart until you just hug it and weep with it as you read it. Let it become that precious to you. And I assure you, if so, the Lord will begin to help you, and he will say to you what he says in Psalms chapter 2, Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. I don't want to own the world but I want to take the world for Jesus. God bless you very much. Amen. Henry, I wish we had another hour to continue because the anointing of the Lord is very strong right now. My guest, Mr. Henry Groover, the prayer walker, and his website is joyfulsoundministries.com. God bless you, Henry. So good to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Blessings on you, and I will be praying for you. You sound like I, I sounded a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I, I will always enjoy your prayers and appreciate them. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you. God bless you. My friend, if your name is not written in the book of life, if you've never Repent it of your sins, call upon the name of Jesus, and ask Almighty God, the creator of the universe, to forgive you and to save you and to write your name in his book of life. Now is the time to do it. This is the hour. This is the day for your salvation. You have no guarantee that you'll be here tomorrow, but you are here right now. You are hearing the gospel that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth in human flesh, was crucified by mankind. He was buried, but he was raised from the dead by God. And he ascended into heaven and is seated at the heavenly places right now beside our Father and is coming back in glory. That's the gospel. Believe on the name of Jesus and you shall be saved. 